from Jane. Um, first to start, is anybody familiar with the Divine Comedy? Is anybody familiar with Dante's Inferno? Okay, there we go. If you guys have seen Tom Hanks as Robert Langdon in the Inferno movie, then you're definitely familiar with um, Inferno. Um, yes, thank you. Um, turn around heads, buried upside down, fun stuff. Um, so that's the text that I'm working with. Um, I'm looking at it from a historical perspective, which is a little bit different because usually when you're looking at texts, you'll be talking to people who are in literature. Um, so I'm taking a slightly different approach to that. Um, so I'll tell you first a little bit about the Divine Comedy. So it was written by Dante Alighieri in between the year 1308 and 1321. Um, he was exiled from Italy for political reasons, which I won't get into. Um, but during his exile is when he wrote the Divine Comedy. Um, it is three parts, what you can see, most people are familiar with Dante's Inferno, but that's only one part of the Divine Comedy. It's actually three parts, which Inferno um, is a journey through hell, um, and then it goes into um, Purgatorio, which is Purgatory, and then eventually ends up in Paradiso, which is heaven. Um, so it starts with Dante as the pilgrim, which is very thinly veiled autobiography. Um, and so he starts at the beginning, um, going into a cave, going down into hell, um, emerges out the other side of the globe and goes up the mountain of purgatory that leads him up into the stars and planets where um, heaven exists. Um, so it's 14,233 lines of poetry, which I have read every single one of them myself. <laughs> It was quite a journey. I was exhausted afterward. Um, it was written in Italian, which is different because most poetry during this time was written in Latin. Um, and so Dante made a point of writing it in what we call the vernacular, which is just basically the spoken language of wherever um, people, whoever's writing it, um, what their spoken language is. Um, it is modeled after Virgil's Aeneid, if you guys are at all familiar with that. Um, and Virgil is actually uh, the pilgrim's uh, guide through most of the Divine Comedy as a character. Um, and it's currently classified as literature or epic poetry. And one of the things that I'm really looking at is how do we classify it in a different way? Um, because I believe that we could look at the Divine Comedy through a lens of mythology. Um, so I'm looking at a lot of different things. There are a lot of moving parts to this project. This is the theoretical part of the project. And um, the reason I want to look at the Divine Comedy through the lens of mythology is because most scholars consider mythology to basically have existed only in the ancient world. Um, there are a lot of things that change once we move into the medieval period, and they don't consider um, texts that are written in the medieval period as mythological because they believe that the way society has changed makes them not really mythological anymore. Um, there's a lot that goes into that that I won't get into. Um, but we understand myth, the way we use the term myth in um, modern language is kind of like a lie. Um, but when we look at mythology from a scholarly perspective, there are a lot of aspects to it that are cultural and sociological um, and how they are true to the people that adhere to the myths. Um, so true myths are typically tied to religion as opposed to legends or folk tales or fairy tales. A lot of times we see those things lumped together, um, but myths have very different thing, uh, different characteristics about them. Um, they often include cosmogonies, which are stories of creation, and they also include etiologies, which are explanations of phenomena. Um, which is usually like you might see like why does the um, sun rise? And you know, set in, rise in the east and set in the west. That's something that a myth might explain, and that's an etiology. Um, and they typically encourage cultural rituals. They're very uh, ingrained into the way people live in society, in the society and the culture that they're a part of. So there are a few things I'm looking at. There are there are many aspects of mythology. Some of them I'm just taking for granted because I certainly can't go through all of them and um, you know go through the divine comedy and check them all off. Um, but there are four particular criteria that I'm looking at that are somewhat outside of the typical expectations of mythology. 
Um, one is that it reflects the ideology and morals of its time and place. Um, myths emerge from the culture that they are in and they are very tied to the culture and they, they show a lot of aspects of the culture in the narrative. Um, they also contribute original images and ideology to its mythological canon. Um, myths typically are not a single story, but a group of many stories, and each one of them offers something different. So it might be a new god, a new story, um, a new way of looking at something. So it should, if it's going to be part of the canon, it should contribute something new. It reinforces belief through the prescription of rituals, and then that it transcends popular culture in the life, life, life of its adherents and is considered sacred. So as opposed to literature, which we might read and maybe would be somewhat influential in some ideas we have, mythology is deeply ingrained in the culture and it's considered sacred. So the main things that I'm looking at is how does the divine comedy reflect and reinforce medieval Christian ideals and rituals? Um, I'm very interested in, from a mythological perspective in how a text emerges from the culture that it's in, but then how once it's disseminated back into the culture, how it then reinforces those ideas. So I'm using the intellectual history methods, which is a little bit different than um, history. If you guys have taken a history class, you probably learn a lot of political stuff, a lot of social stuff. Um, intellectual history specifically looks at texts. And it's an interdisciplinary method that combines literary analysis, putting text into historical context, and then looking at the philosophy that's in the text as well. Um, so I'm particularly analyzing the symbolism and ideology that's in the Divine Comedy. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that once we move into Purgatorio. Um, I'm placing the text in historical context to understand its influences and its influence on society. And then I'm particularly comparing it to 12th to 14th century ecclesiastical documents, which are church documents, um, to see how ideology is changing in the Christian church, um, how, what it looks like before Dante and after Dante to be able to show influence. So I'm particularly looking at the development of purgatory, which is the second section. And the reason that I chose this is because um, though Inferno is more influential and more, and more popular, um, we get a lot of the, the information that comes into the Inferno um, that influences Dante's ideas of hell come a lot from Roman um, mythology and Greek mythology. So we kind of already understand um, where that influence is coming from, and it also is being influenced from texts that are much older. I really want to look at how the divine comedy is reflective of its time and place in the 12th to 14th century. And purgatory was developed in the 12th century, um, which may be surprising to some people because we, I think purgatory is pretty well known now, but in the Bible, uh, what we have is what are called purgatorial fires. It's much more of like a process than a place. Um, someone might go through purgatorial fires and come out cleansed, but it's not a place, there's no location, there's no understanding or details about what it actually is. Um, that develops in the 12th century through scholasticism and ideological structuring that happens in history in this time and place. Um, so I'm looking specifically at purgatory. This is an illustration of what it looks like in the different levels, just like the circles of hell that you might be familiar with are also circles of purgatory. Um, and so this is an illustration of what they are, and they are associated with particular cardinal sins or what you might know of as the seven deadly sins. So the progress that I'm uh, at right now is that um, I've analyzed most of the, the text and have been looking at a lot of the, um, the characteristics of mythology and comparing them to the Divine Comedy. So what I found is that the divine comedy does reflect 12th to 14th century Christian ideology with its inclusion of purgatory. Because like I said, purgatory developed specifically at this time in this place. If you look at Christianity in the East, um, in the Byzantine Empire, it is not an accepted doctrine. Um, and also once we move into um, the Protestant Reformation, it does not get accepted by Protestants. So it's very specific to Latin West Christianity. 
Um, and also we have particular councils that happen during this time where they talk about uh, purgatory and the seven cardinal vices or the seven deadly sins were very prominent during this time. Um, the, the original uh, image that gets contributed from Dante is that purgatory is a place because like I said, that is not true in the Bible. Um, and then Purgatorio reflects and encourages ritual, the rituals of confession, penance, and suffrages. Um, and then the last one I haven't gotten fully to yet, um, which is that it transcends popular culture and is considered sacred. Um, we don't see a lot of the Divine Comedy as being considered sacred, but I have found a papal speech um, that was given in the 19th century or the 20th century um, that actually by the Pope calls Dante a Catholic treasure, um, which to me says that, you know, the Divine Comedy has been widely accepted and has been, if it's accepted by the Catholic Church itself, that's a pretty good indication that they back up what he says in the Divine Comedy. So, questions? Why why I choose to focus on such a popular like focus on like ancient Christianity and in this area? What do you mean by popular? Well, gosh, I don't even know why it's in that question. Um, <laughs> like Dante's Inferno is incredibly popular, at least some normal people are being very good. Was there a significant reason that you chose to look at purgatory rather than like like heaven or compare the two? Yeah. Um. So, well, it is popular. Uh, there are not many other uh, written literatures that would be considered mythology. Um. Outside, even in the classical period, we have a limited amount from the Western canon. At least we have a limited number of mythologies. Um, you know, obviously be familiar with Greek mythology, Roman mythology. Um, once we move into the Middle Ages, we've got Norse mythology, but there aren't a lot of other mythologies that develop um, out of the classical period. And so the Divine Comedy is a text that is most closely related to mythological texts that come before it. There really aren't any others. Um, so that one stands out um, from other texts in the Western canon. Um, and then, like I said, as far as looking at Purgatorio in particular, um, because in order to show that the Divine Comedy is mythology, it has to reflect its time and place. It has to reflect the culture that it developed in. So yeah, obviously with Dante being in Italy, he's very close to Rome. We're looking at Roman Catholicism before it was technically Catholic, um, but it it's Roman Christianity. Um, and so it it was developing right there in Rome, you know, in this area, and it's very reflective of its time and place. Whereas other texts that, a, a lot of other texts in the Middle Ages are much closer to legend or folktale, fairy tale. This one is um, the one that has stories about creation um, and are, is looking at like the development of the universe and those kinds of ideas. Did you read this in its original language or did you read it? It's, yeah. I don't speak Italian nor read it. Um, occasionally my Spanish came in handy when there were certain um, words that I wanted to understand um, from its Italian because obviously whenever you're looking at a translation, um, it's an interpretation of the text. And so you do, if you, if you really want to understand exactly what the author was trying to say, you do want to kind of go back to the original language. Um, so there were a couple of times where I went back to it, but no, I, I read it in English. Okay. Follow up on that question. Did you use more than one translation? I did not. Um, I, I mostly just use it. Well, I mean, there are some online translations that I've gone to, but because I'm not, I, I look at it more thematically um, rather than like analyzing particular words. Um, and a lot of the themes that I'm looking at are pretty well understood. Um, 
So I'm not like, you know, parsing particular meanings or definitions um, because we're looking at like bigger picture. So when I say ideology, what I mean is like the big ideas and the belief systems. Um, so I don't necessarily need to like nitpick on little words in order to accomplish my goal. Um, I'm mostly just looking at like, what are the big themes here? Yes. <laughs> Donald's contribution is that he uh, turned purgatory into a place. Yes. As opposed to the abstract concept. Um, so how specifically did he do that? Yes. So um, Dante turns the purgatorio into a mountain. Um, so like I said, once he comes out on the other side of the globe, which I find this interesting. So the, the way that we get the mountain of purgatory is that when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he was thrown down. And so... Lucifer ends up at the bottom of Inferno. So um, Dante descends down into, um, into Inferno through hell and, um, and ends at the bottom. So the very last thing Dante, uh, the pilgrim encounters at the bottom of hell is Lucifer and he climbs up Lucifer and kind of flips around, comes out on the other side and all of that earth that was inside gets pushed out to the other side on the opposite end of Jerusalem. And so then we have this mountain of purgatory. And there, there are some connections in the Bible that have ideas about how um, it could have been created, this idea of a mountain, why he chose a mountain. Um, there are some sections of the Bible that talk about on mountains you can reach the heavens. Um, and so he turns it into a place by creating it as a mountain and then creating these circles of purgatory by adding in the medieval concept of the seven cardinal sins. Yeah. So were you kind of cross-examining um, the divine comedy with the Bible? Um, yes. I mean, if you're going to read the divine comedy, you kind of have to have the Bible close at hand. Um, it, it's the Bible is on basically every page. Things there are references to the Bible. There are characters from the Bible. Um, there are I, I use so when I was talking about the mythological canon before. Um, I'm using the Bible as like the main mythological text that the Divine Comedy is associating itself with, as far as being part of a mythological canon. Um, which at Based on the work that I do, I have to look at the text, even though we look at it as just like a sacred text that we all accept, you know, Christians accept as true. In When you're looking at it from um, a scholastic perspective, you have to look at it as a text, as a mythological text. And so it's associating itself with the Bible. And so you kind of have to, yeah look at the Bible, look at verses. I've included many Bible verses in my thesis. Yeah. So my question is kind of related in a way in that, so we, you mentioned that in the Bible, there's some references to purgatorial fires. And then you mentioned that Dante kind of develops really this whole concept of purgatory. How much in between the, um, the text that were coded into the Bible, and then when Dante wrote, how much is purgatory ever referred to in that intermediate space based on what we have in this Minimally. Um, yeah, it's, so there are some um, preachers who kind of preached about purgatory, um, because obviously we've got, you know, the Bible was developed in like the, and put together in the first century or fifth century. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in the first century, it, it was like brought together. Um, so we have you know 1200 years roughly from the Bible to um Divine Comedy. Um, and so we do have evidence of preachers preaching about purgatory, but again, it's it's still very minimalistic. Um, they're just really it, it doesn't even start to be thought of as a place until the high middle ages, because that's when idea, like that's when people start talking about, you know, if you're not really, really bad and going to hell and not really, really good and going straight to heaven, what happens to those people? And so they really just don't start talking about that until the high middle ages. And so that's why it's like, okay, well, if we're not going straight to hell, we're not going to heaven, well, where are we going? And so that's when, the idea of it being a place starts to be developed, um, but it's never really written down as a place until the time. So we always think that could you um, 
hypothesizing that Dante is the one that kind of really solidified that. Yes. Yeah, that's my thesis. Yep. <laughs> cool. Is he also solidifying the notion of redemption? And please understand, I know almost nothing yeah. of the mythology that we sure. have, but. We're either going to hell or we're going to heaven, or here's this new idea. Yeah. Hundred years ago. Yeah. You can kind of work it out. So we see this in church doctrine and in the canons um, that, like, if I, the some of the ecclesiastical texts I'm looking at um, for the church councils, they're basically even before Dante already kind of promoting this idea that if you do penance and you do confession that you can, you know, purge yourself of your sins. Um, but when you look at the Divine Comedy, confession and penance are not always enough. Um, and so it's like a starting point, but if you haven't done enough work on earth when you die, you have to go through this process of being cleansed. And so each step of purgatorio cleanses you from a particular sin. And by the time you reach the end, you go through the purgatorial fires um, that are actually included in the Divine Comedy there at the top. And then you get to enter earthly paradise, which is the stepping stone up into heaven. Yeah. So you said mythology has to be accepted by the people? Yes. What made this, why would they accept this story? Especially if there's like this new description of purgatory, why would they not just call it classic? Yeah, and that's a great question, and that's something that Dante worked really hard to do. Um, he made sure that he didn't say anything, because heresy was huge at this time. Like, it was a big problem at this time, and it, there was a huge crackdown on heresy. Um, so if you said something that wasn't in line with what the Catholic Church believed, you could absolutely be condemned to death. Um, so he worked very hard to make sure that he didn't overstep boundaries. Um I, the question you're asking is a big part of the research that I'm doing, um, because the hard part about the Divine Comedy is that we get a drastic shift in belief systems right after the Divine Comedy. We move into the Renaissance, and all of a sudden people don't want to be relying on religious texts anymore. They want to start relying on themselves. Um, we're starting to move in toward the Enlightenment area coming, you know, after that. Um, so we don't get to see the impact of the Divine Comedy as much as we would like, because the way society shifts, it's just, it kind of gets set aside. Um, so while I don't necessarily, like, it, it is widely read during his time and ideas um, get accepted into popular culture, I'm still doing more analysis on looking at texts that would show that it is accepted um, in the doc in the doctrine and in church documents that that's why I want to specifically look at church documents because if the church says it's true then it must be okay <laughs> um, and I do have some like sermons um, that I found where they are actually preaching about Dante um, and like I said the the papal um, speech that I have and then um, if we see purgatory as a place in any other ecclesiastical documents, I mean, that's a pretty good indicator that it's been, if not accepted as sacred, that it's been widely enough accepted that we can call it influential in doctrine and ideology. But the, the hard part, and I'm actually working on this part right now, is that in the ancient world, it was much easier for people to accept um, when somebody said that they were divinely inspired. Um, and they would, you know, tell the story orally or it would get written down. Once you hit the Middle Ages, people are not really talking about, like, if you say you were divinely inspired, they're like, sure, guy. <laughs> Whatever you say. So that's what makes it kind of harder to get that. Like, Dante said he was divinely inspired, but nobody really takes that fact anymore. All right. Thank you so much.